an ongoing discussion on ethics and technology. I'm Elizabeth Perry with IDCA. We hear a lot about data these days. Um, and often it's not good news. Data breaches, privacy violations, big fines, stolen identities, and even just a lack of transparency, like what's in the fine print. We've talked a lot about regulation like GDPR in Europe, CCPA in uh, California, but what does it all mean? Uh, today, we're going to dig deeper into that uh, sometimes incomprehensible word data. What's up with your data? Here to help us unravel the mystery of it all and maybe even help make data fun is someone who's spent a lot of time in the area, so much so that one journalist has dubbed her the data diva. Coming to us from Chicago, uh, global Data Privacy and Protection Officer, speaker, author, Debbie Reynolds. So welcome, Debbie. Uh, Debbie, I can't see you, but maybe we're having some technical difficulties back there. Um, that's okay, because we're going to just keep going. Um, hello. hello, there she is. All right. So there we are. Uh, Debbie, it's great to see you in your domain over there in Chicago. Thank you so much. Thank you All so right, much. you're welcome. We had a bit of technical difficulties, but I'm back now. That's good. Well, you look good. So here we go. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today. But first, before we dive in, a little background. Um, tell us a bit about your journey to now. What has brought you into the world of data? Well, um, I've always been sort of a data nerd. Uh, I began my uh, data career actually by happenstance. So uh, in college, I was a philosophy major. Uh, but when I uh, was leaving college, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And I wanted to find something that I can do to uh, spend more time with her. So I decided to buy, I would buy a computer, teach myself to use it. And then I started doing sort of desktop publishing. And then I got into sort of doing database things. And then eventually someone called me up, uh, you know, I started a business and someone called me up to ask me to help them create uh, databases for university libraries. So this was during the time when people were moving from card catalogs to computers, you know, you can, I know, I'm sure people nowadays can even imagine the card catalog system looking for books, but this is sort of what I was doing. And eventually I started doing that for different types of businesses, like legal businesses, you know, not just universities and things like that. So I've always had like an interest in, in data. And then in 1997, I read a book called The Right to Privacy. Uh, and it was fascinating to me about just the different modes of privacy, what's private and what isn't, you know, the individual's rights. And that's a concept that I had always been very interested in and I followed over the years. I just didn't realize that it would converge, uh, you know, it, it, data privacy would become so important in the world now. So I'm sort of joining my, uh, you know, my hobby uh, and my expertise in privacy with my technology skills. So marrying those together brought me into a data privacy business. Okay, and now I'm sure the audience wants to know, um, what's the story behind your, your crown uh, data diva? <laughs> uh, it's a funny story. Uh, so I was at a networking event and I met a woman. She's a, a journalist with the Wall Street Journal and we were talking with each other, giving each other our elevator speeches. And uh, as I was explaining to her what I did, she said, oh, you're, so you're the data diva. And we laughed at that. And I thought, oh, wow, that's 
interesting. So she was like, oh, you totally should use it. And at first I was really bashful about it uh, because I thought, well, maybe people wouldn't take me seriously. But then I thought, she's smart. She's a journalist. You know, they know how to like wrap things up really quickly. So uh, I started using it and people love it. So I get calls off from all over the world and people say, oh my God, I totally love this. So it helps start the conversation and I, I really enjoy using it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great honor, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, so you, you say you speak at conferences all over the world. Um, and what do you speak about? What do people want to know? People want to know what, well, so what, one thing that they want to know, obviously the, the data privacy laws, but I, what I always try to do is give people practical things that they can take away and also explain the meaning of it. So I think knowing that there's, you know, the GDPR exists in Europe is one thing, but understanding what it means to you as an individual, what it means to you as a, a business person or someone who's running a company or how you have to change the way that you, you operate your business or change the way you store data. That's the way I try to tell the story to people. So that it is very relatable to what they need to know and something that they can actually take away and do something with. Mm -hmm. And what's the biggest problem we face today around data? Uh, I think the biggest problem that we face around data is understanding what, where it goes. So mm -hmm. let's say, you know, you have your phone and you're walking down the street uh, you know, you're just living your life. But what you don't may not understand is that, you know, your every movement is, is transmitted by say the phone that's in your pocket and obviously it goes to the phone, but then, you know, depending on the apps that you're using, it may be going to other people and then, you know, other people, it may be sold to someone else. And right now mm -hmm. I think people can't really comprehend how companies are using this data, but it's, pretty frightening, especially if you find out, you know, for example, um, I think someone had done, um, someone had done a study about uh, where data goes. Let's say you enter something in on Facebook or Google or whatever. I mean, your data could be sold. Something as innocuous as you think that you're walking down the street uh, could be transmitted and sold to, you know, hundreds of companies. So it's, it's baffling to people and mind boggling. Uh, that the information about them that's collected, first of all, that anyone would want that and the types of things that they're doing with that information. Well, so tell us, let's dig a little deeper there and um, tell me what does happen. So let's, do, let's take a little trip with a piece of data, okay. if you will. Um, so I, I enter, I, I log in or I sign up for Facebook, say. We talk a lot about Facebook and how, you know, they're the evil yeah. people, right? <laughs> Everybody yeah. nowadays, they, that's what people are talking about. So, so talk to me right. about what happens when I, when I sign up for a service like that and I enter my name and my password and yeah. whatever of other information. Right. So when you sign up for a service like that, uh, you know, we're just picking on Facebook, but they're definitely not the only company who does this. So when you sign up, uh, they're taking your details, they're, figuring out who you know. Uh, as you know, when you go in there, they try to suggest people and they're pretty good at it. So if you put your name in there, they can pretty much pull up people that either are in your family or people that you worked with, that you're connecting with. And they're sort of creating a web of information about you and, and for, mar for the sake of marketing. So mm -hmm. the marketers really want this very targeted information. So they say, you know, Elizabeth is in Barcelona. She likes to drink you know, chai latte or something. So they will be able to tell a marketer, hey, we'll pay you, you know, if you pay us this money, we'll give you access to Elizabeth so that you can deliver her this ad. But beyond that, uh, because there really aren't any, uh, at least in the, the US, there aren't any strict rules about what happens to that data after that. Um, let's say the marketer says, okay, I'm selling this information about Elizabeth, but now that I've collected this information about Elizabeth and all her friends or whatever, maybe I want to send it over to a data broker that's going to give me a, some money for this, you know, for this bundle of data that I send them. And then once it gets past that sort of third party, it's just 
you have no clue how this sort of shows up. Uh, one example of this would be, uh, let's say, if people tell me about this all the time. Let's say you're on, like, like you're on Amazon, you're searching for something, and then you close out Amazon, and you go to your web browser, and then the ad for the thing that you were looking for shows up there. Or, uh, you know, you get an email out, out of the blue about something that you were talking about. Maybe your phone overheard you saying it. So, to some people, they don't mind it. Some people feel it's very, you know, obtrusive. Uh, but I think just understanding where the data goes and, under, and trying, to, trying to get uh, companies to provide transparency about what they're doing with this data. And, you know, the, this, these are billion dollar businesses that are built on buying and selling this information that is basically invisible to the public at this point. So hopefully the mm -hmm. types of regulations that are being passed now, especially in the U.S., will at least bring some transparency to that because you may say, I'm totally fine with this. I'm totally fine with this company selling my data to like 10 other people. I don't mind that. But I think because there isn't enough transparency, it's hard for the, the consumer to object because they have no idea what's happening. Right. Yeah. And that brings us to some of the regulation that's going on right now. I mean, here in Europe, we talk a lot about GDPR. We talk a lot about... Um, you know, the California consumer privacy. Uh, I always get confused. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we, we hear a lot about these and their acronyms, but let's, let's drill down there too. Let's tell people, um, maybe for the newbies in the audience, especially for our U.S. folks, what is GDPR and how does it affect U.S. companies or okay. anywhere in the world, really? Okay. Uh, so GDPR is a regulation uh, that is enforced in the EU. It has to do with uh, preserving the fundamental human right of persons in the EU to have their data uh, protected or private. Uh, it, it extends uh, across the world for any company that handles a person's data who's in the EU. So it means that wherever your data goes, so do your rights go for companies. So uh, in the U.S. it's been very interesting. Uh, I think that because the GDPR has such a high fine, which is which would be like 4% of a company's annual uh, revenue, that started to get C-suite attention because uh, it's funny because people feel like, oh, GDPR is so tough. And it is tough in a lot of ways, but it's not very different than the previous privacy directive that the EU had, you know, for 15 years prior to that. So I really think the fines with the GDPR is the thing that really got people's attention and got the C-suite really thinking about changing the way that they're operating. And for us in, in the U.S., even though we don't have GDPR-like laws, once the GDPR came out, now every single website we go to, even though there, it's not required in the U.S., has all these cookie consent things. You know, I thought it would just happen in the EU because this, you know, how that happens. But, you know, I, you know, I am not a, a EU person. Uh, so the fact that, the fact that we're all getting these cookies tells me, or these cookie consents tell me that companies haven't architected their backend data to really distinguish, or maybe they don't want to distinguish between people who are in the EU or the US. And I think as these privacy laws get more complicated, that uh, the segmentation of being able to target and do different things with different people's data is going to become more important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and we talked, I just touched briefly on the California Consumer Privacy Act, which came out in, which was, I guess, in 2018. Right. Um, is this like a mirror image of GDPR in terms of like protecting people's data or yeah, or, or what's really going on there? So uh, CCPA is, has some similarities to GDPR. Probably the most notable uh, similarity is that uh, believe it or not, the state of California has had written in their constitution since uh, 1972 that privacy is a fundamental human right. They're currently the only state that has that. Uh, so that is a parallel that they have with the EU currently. Um, the 
and also the CCPA tries to target uh, an individual's uh, individual's rights and kind of all encompassing of their mm -hmm. data as opposed to other laws in the U.S. is mostly about certain types of data like financial data, health data, uh, you know, in, uh, data about uh, minors and things like that. So CCPA is is the the first U.S. law that is as comprehensive about kind of all data types. Basically, they're saying anything that that a company, a for-profit company, can use and possibly sell of a consumer, they need to provide transparency. The GDPR, mm -hmm. in contrast, is about uh, it's for not just for-profit companies, but it's you know all types of different companies so it's, it's broader in that sense mm -hmm. um, the the definition of personal information or sensitive information in the the ccpa is a little bit more narrow than the gdpr but that but it's still broader than anything that we have in the u.s mm -hmm. uh, i think one thing that people need to realize is in the 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 eu uh, because the the eu had like their data directive you know, 15 years before the GDPR, this is, you know, this has been codified in laws in the EU, you know, for, you know, two decades almost, uh, where the CCPA is brand new. There's like nothing like it. It's not replacing, you know, it's not replacing anything that's been in place. So it, uh, it's totally, it's hard to compare them uh, to one another because mm -hmm. in the U.S. it's so different to anything else that we have about data privacy. So why, and so you say that because California has this definition of, um, and that's why it maybe started in California, um, right. because they have this definition of, of privacy or people's data that's different than other states, right? Right. That's correct. Okay. And so what are some examples, or so now that we have GDPR, now that we have CCPA and other, I guess other laws are coming into effect as well, right? I mean, yes, yes. So in there other are, states. just around the world. So around the world, data privacy is really heating up. Uh, definitely since the GDPR went into effect, we're seeing, you know, first of all, there are, there were countries that had their own laws. Uh, the GDPR came out and because it was so comprehensive. I think. Uh, uh, countries started to step up and try to pass more comprehensive types of laws. So uh, it, the activity has definitely picked up, I would say, in the last four or five years in terms of regulation or people trying to pass laws. In the U.S., I think they say something like 23 states currently, since the, GDP, since the CCPA passed, are looking to pass some type of more comprehensive data privacy legislation than they have currently. Mm hmm. And um, so jumping around a little bit here, um, what are some examples of why it's important to protect our ourselves online? I mean, we have GDPR, we have CCPA. What else? I mean, why are we so worried? Why? What are we worried about if we have these laws in place? Well, we're worried about, um, you know, manipulation of the information, being able to let's say, let's say having your information put into a system and it's incorrect. Let's say if you were trying to cross a border and then you ended up on like a no-fly list and you say, well, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, it's in a computer that maybe, you know, they got you confused with someone else. So all, I mean, a lot of the things that are happening with data are so, um, you know, obtuse that people, people do not know what's happening with their data. They don't see what's happening. And mm -hmm. those things can actually harm you in the future. You know, let's say, you know, you said something online and your employer used it against you, but they didn't tell you, you know, it may not even be legal. So you don't know whether your rights are being violated. Uh, obviously for identity theft purposes, uh, this is really interesting. So especially when um, I think it was the Equifax data breach, which is really interesting Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are the credit or reporting agencies that, that uh, you know, they, they do, they help other companies validate you. So let's say uh, you want to 
apply for a credit card and they want to make sure that you're the person to say you are and they'll ask you like what house did you live in where you grew up what was your best friend's name uh if someone ha has uh, hacked into those systems and they have that information they can answer those questions as if they were you and they can steal your identity and it would be hard for you to prove that it wasn't you because they knew that information yeah that and that's that's a good example um i think you know and i say this on on a lot but <laughs> you know what happens to when you speak to like the millennial generation a lot of them will just say you know why well, do have nothing to hide when in fact we all have something to hide we don't want everybody to know all of this you know password information or you know security question information right i mean what are some other examples of stories you might have about how our data is you know being manipulated or being sold or you know what are some examples well this is an interesting well two two examples i have so and this is about voice so about you talking so you know how our cell phones are set where you know you have the your voice assistant listening you know for you to call their name but they're but it's all also listening when you're not wanting them to so if you have like uh you know again i'm not picking on anyone's product so you know the smart thermostat the smart speakers the phones with the personal assistants your tv uh, all those things have capabilities to really listen in on you and some companies are getting in trouble because they're actually keeping and listening to that information and it's not clear what they're actually doing with that information uh, i actually was having a conversation with someone actually my brother uh, a couple of years ago and we were talking about something and uh, uh, I think he was trying to remember the name of the secretary of defense at the time and his phone was just on the counter and literally his phone started talking and said well the, you know the current secretary of defense is blah 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 and I could have just fallen over it's like we did not <laughs> ask the phone this the phone just said this he thought it was funny I was totally creeped out by it you know the fact that you know this you know, I had not given the phone or he hadn't given the phone permission to, to you know, uh, go into our conversation, but obviously they were there. So it, it makes me wonder what happens with that information. And obviously mm -hmm. they're listening when you probably don't want them to be listening. And uh, what, it, let's see, you were telling me the other day offline, you were telling me about the ham story, which I found <laughs> very, very funny and, and just, pointing to the, to the right thing i mean what so this is a good one tell tell us about the coffee shop and the ham story <laughs> okay okay the ham story it's hilarious so i have many ham stories so this is a really good one so i was trying to give an example of what happens with your data uh, or what could possibly happen how far we're getting with sort of data technology ai so let's say you go into a coffee shop, you have your phone, you have your credit card, you order the same thing every Tuesday, and it's a ham sandwich. So every Tuesday you go in this coffee shop, you have your phone, you have your loyalty card for this store, and they know it's you, right? So let's say one Tuesday you forget your, you don't have your phone, you don't have your loyalty card, and you pay cash, and you order a ham sandwich. Chances are, even though you did not give them any identifying information because of your pattern of behavior be before that, they may think they can probably, uh, there's a good chance that they're going to assume that it's you and they're probably going to be right. Let's say someone comes in, you know, uh, the next Tuesday orders a ham sandwich like you typically do. You're not there and they rob the place. Let's say that they, they may say, well, you're may, you may be a suspect now because this is your pattern of behavior. And then on sort of the, 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 uh, the supply side of the company, they're saying, okay, based on the analytics of this store, these are the products that people buy. So let's get more ham because this guy orders ham sandwiches every Tuesday. So let's say the next Tuesday, you go into the store and you want to order a turkey sandwich. And they say they don't have turkey because you order ham. So if you order ham sandwich, that's all they have. That's what you're going to have. So the issue is 
now they're using the information in a way that's almost controlling your actions or controlling your behavior. And it's really uh, kind of frightening, actually. Yeah, and, and it, it brings to mind, and I don't know, maybe the social media. Right. You know, you're on Facebook and just tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, you get the feeling that when you're posting something or you're liking something or you're reacting to something or making a comment that you get more and more information that's like that. Oh, absolutely. So in other words, yeah, but it could happen in a way that doesn't allow you to sort of see outside of that way of thinking that, that those angles of thought or you know what I mean a thousand percent so this is now someone told me this at a conference and I tried it uh because I didn't believe it but it's true (laughs) so like I have Netflix like everyone else does and my biggest thing with Netflix is like I want them to show me everything that's on Netflix so I can pick as opposed to them suggesting things and after a while they still put up a lot of information but you get the feeling that that's all there is so uh, so a, a woman at a conference, she said that she has two accounts or two profiles on Netflix where one she uses her name and then the other she uses the name of a man. And because it's a man's name, she gets different things shown to her. And I really didn't believe it. So I actually did this experiment and I uh, put up a new profile with a guy's name and my boyfriend still laughs at me that I do this. And lo and behold, uh, the movies that I was shown totally different so I was showing like more thrillers more action stuff you know more um, you know gritty things as opposed to rom-coms and stuff like that so I could not believe it I just and it's true that um, that it sort of takes you uh, when, when you're doing social media or you're doing anything on the internet the um, these companies are trying to curate your experience. So in some ways it's good. So they're showing you things that you want to see, but it's almost giving you the idea that that's all there is to see. So you're not seeing everything else outside of that. Right. And, and yeah. And then there's fake news and, and stuff that, that people are posting that they have no idea if it's, I mean, that's not really what we're talking about, but it is because you're talking about being fed even if it's fake news or even whatever it is, you're being fed things that, that the algorithm thinks that you want to hear. So you're well, not hearing other points of view. Right. I, I remember once I had talked to someone because, you know, whenever there's like a breaking news story, you know, like CNN or the Washington Post or certain news agencies try to get it out first. And I can't remember exactly what the news story was. But I asked, I had to ask someone if they had heard of it. And they were like, well, no, because it, ha- it hasn't been on Facebook. So literally this person gets their news from Facebook. So if it wasn't on Facebook, they would not have known about it. Like that's what they were like waiting for. They wouldn't, you know, a lot of people, they're not uh, diverse enough in their sort of news sources or the avenues that they're looking at. So being able to, it's very powerful to be able to have people who look to you as sort of a source for many different things when it actually, it was not really designed for that. And, you know, as you say, because it's, there's so much, um, there's so many more sort of personal opinions and things that are mixed in and it, it really, you know, it's hard to distinguish that sometimes because sometimes it looks like news and it really isn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so we're talking about the consumer a lot, but what about the professionals? Um, you know, what are the challenges that, that we face as professionals as it relates to data? I think the challenges we face uh, as professionals, well, I mean, there are many different facets of it. So let's say you in a workplace, you know, how you, you know, something as simple as, you know, not putting your password on a post-it note or, you know, not making it easy for someone to, to get your credentials and log in, to just being aware that, you know, the world is changing, the, the data is becoming more diverse, the information is converging in ways maybe we had not even anticipated. So like I was saying, the phone listening to your conversation, uh, let's say you had, uh, let's say you work for a, uh, let's say you have like a top secret clearance or something 
and you have a phone in a room where it's literally listening to your conversation, what happens to that information? Or, you know, you have situations where, uh, like you're, you're texting, let, let's say you're, um, uh, just to make it easy on yourself, say, say you have like work information and you're, you know, texting it back on your phone. Now you're like commingling work and sort of your personal information together. I think it's, it's hard because, you know, a lot of us, you know, we, we have flexible lives and want to have as much flexibility as possible, but the lives, lines are blurred between personal and business so much. And that could be a concern. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's important to, to think about the tools you're using to communicate, whether you're, you know, on Facebook as a, as you're, you know, have your individual hat on. And then when you have your professional hat on, there should be tools like IDCA, for example, um, you know, where you can privately communicate confidential information or share it with your colleagues without worrying about whether or not it's leaking out into your personal network or your circle, right? Are right. there examples that you can think of that, you know, where that comes into play, where the tools that you use are? Well, sure, yeah. I think, um, I don't know. I guess for me, I don't think of it in terms of tool, but I think of it in terms of sort of what you do with the tool. Like, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I know a lot of people like to blend, you know, blend their sort of personal and their business stuff on Facebook and that doesn't always work. Right. So it's like, you know, your friends from high school probably don't want to know about this new initiative that you did at work, just as, you know, your business associates don't want to know that you had went to a birthday party or something like that. So. Right. I think it, you know, it, it puts a lot of pressure on us to be our own sort of data privacy managers or uh, to figure out what are the best channels for us to, to send messages. Um, one, one thing I want to want to uh, chat about, want to sort of add in here, uh, I want to give you an example of something because you had mentioned Facebook, um, mm -hmm. about liking something on Facebook. So uh, this had to do a bit with the Cambridge Analytica uh, issue. So sure. I listened to the whistleblower's testimony and some of the things that he had written about the, 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 the psychological profiles that they had put together on people, which is frightening because the, because even though they were taking data of individuals and they were doing different things with it, the psychological profiles that they were creating, even legally, they did not have any obligation to turn that information over to to the individual. So that's sort of considered like a work, um, uh, a derivative work uh, that, that if anonymized properly would not be something that you would even know about. Uh, but he had told a story about uh, when they were doing these mis misinformation campaigns, uh, they found that they, they had this thing called the Kit Kat Project. So they found that um, whenever they had an ad about Kit Kat, if someone liked it, if they sent that person a message that seemed like it was a, um, uh, uh, like an anti-Semitic message, they were also like that. So in, in the data set they had, they correlated these two together and they called this a Kit Kat project. So wow. let's say down the line, someone were to say, let's say you like Kit Kat. Does that mean you're an anti-Semite? this is a problem, right? Because this is the way that they connected this in a data set. So let's say you you have a job interview and someone saw this, they forgot about the Kit Kat project, but it's connected. You like Kit Kat. Uh, people who like Kit Kat said that they like these anti-Semitic messages and they think you're anti-Semite and you don't get a job because of that. There's but a good example. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, it, it is very important to uh yeah for me it's important that you know people don't use facebook in such a way or other social media platforms in such a way that can get them in trouble because or you know they need to know like you said it's 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 almost impossible to know what's happening behind the scenes um right. with your data um 
And so when is it okay to collect data and when is it not okay? Well, it's okay to collect data if the person, so you, you give it to the person of your own free will, they're, prover- they're providing a service for you, it's necessary for them to provide the service for you. And then you can tell them when you want them to stop using your data. So anything beyond that, I think, you know, and I hope that people sort of all, all around the world we can come to some consensus, even at a base level, about data privacy. I don't think we'll ever get anywhere where we'll universally have the, you know, the same laws all over. But I think if we have sort of at a basic level that if we give someone data, we tell them to do one thing with it and they do something else, that's sort of out of bounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's a good way to look about it, look at it. Um, so, and as a consultant, so I want to talk about, you know, what you do day to day, you know, you advise working with fortune 500 companies as a DC officer. Right. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. tell me about that. And what are some of the challenges you see you, you come across as you attempt to educate or inform these companies about data? I think the challenge that I see a lot is, you know, um, everyone wants to do the best job that they they can do. Uh, so, you know, you have to be really gentle when you're talking with people, especially if there has to be like a behavior change or a correction. And a lot of people feel like, oh, you know, I have a privacy policy. I, you know, I even have a person who's installed as my data privacy officer. You know, I have a checkbox on my website so people can like do cookie consent. And we have to dig a little bit deeper um, because a lot of companies that are getting fined are not, you know, they have all those things. They have great lawyers, they have, you know, staff, they have, you know, cookie consent policies, and they're still getting fined because what, you know, the problem is they aren't able to demonstrate that they have changed their business practices or they have changed the way they collect data and you know I get into this a lot with especially people who do content marketing I explain to them about analytics and how a lot of these companies that are providing these tools they either make it so that you can't either you can't make the tweaks that you need to make uh, on these these uh, other tools that you're using to provide services or you know some like Google they're giving you you know, they're giving the administrator the keys to the kingdom and say, you know, they're offloading this issue to you so that you can sort it out. And a lot of people don't really have the knowledge and understanding of how complex it is to sort it out. Like I was having a whole conversation with people about cookies, you know, and about, you know, Google Analytics and, you know, uh, data privacy and how they have to comply with these cookie consents and certain things that they can and can't do uh, with the data. And someone has told me, you know, well, Google is taking care of that for you. It's like, they have so not done that. You know, they basically, you know, open up the platform in a way to say, you know, you, this is your data, you have to deal with it. So, you know, it is incumbent upon us to really drill down into this data and figure out, you know, okay, we need, we, we have to have this to do this function with our business these other things we don't need how can we get rid of it how can we strip it out how can we you know anonymize the information we are the right people seeing the right things are we keeping too much information so all those types of questions have to be asked and it has to go down to a very fundamental level so it has to it can't be just you know reports and boardrooms and you know conversations it has to be you know, rolling up your sleeves and figuring out, you know, what fields in this database are collecting information that we don't want to do. And this, and this happens a lot in, in applications because it does it passively at times. But, you know, the responsibility is on the corporation to really, really comply in a fulsome way and not do it sort of on the surface. Right. Yeah. This, it's a lot of work. I mean, you know, and, and what that brings up for me is, is it really fair because it, you know, in a lot of it's, it's costly it, it, on it the is. one hand. And then if, if you're not compliant, you pay these huge fines. So it's right. really favoring the larger corporations. Is that not true? I think 
yes and no. So yes, it is, it is or can be costly depending on how hard it is for people to change. But I think the change that people are having problems with is not sort of buying tools and things like that. It's about changing the way they operate. So I'll give you an example. Let's say a company has a database and a default field in their database is like social security numbers. So um, this is probably not, you know, if they, if a company can't justify why they have that or, or even why they designed it in a way to make it a default field, they may have to change that uh, or delete the information. So those are those things, depending on how it's done, like say they mask it or they change it, it may not actually cost them a lot of money to make that change, but there is effort and there's blood, sweat and tears in doing that. Uh, but the one thing I will point to is, you know, we are seeing headlines of very large corporations getting these huge fines and it's not for lack of money. So if money were, the, the solution, uh, then, they, you know, these bigger companies would not be getting fined. So it's a lot more than just uh, just spending money. Uh, it is time consuming to sort of think it through. Uh, I think the thing that people have, have the most problems with, and this is just my opinion, you know, I call it like uh, hoarders to corporate edition. Uh, you know, companies just have too much information. They have too much data and they keep it, you know, and they think, well, uh, you know, maybe we'll have a case for this and maybe we need it for something else in the future. And that, you know, being able to tie the data that you have to sort of what you're actually working on or what's really important is a very interesting and important exercise. And it's something that, that companies, I recommend companies to do even before these privacy laws came about because that data uh, uh, increases the risk, you know, in things like litigation, it increases the risk in like data breach. Um, you know, a lot of these data breach things that are happening, companies can reduce their risk a ton if they're getting rid of data that they don't need. Right, yeah. And another thing um, you touched upon, I think it was in one of your um, many video things. Um, another challenge that, that comes up is that there's no across the board regulation about what you're allowed to do with your data across the board, across the US, for example, or across the world, of course not. But that makes it really difficult, doesn't it, for, for companies to be able to figure out, okay, New York says this, California says this, I've got customers in both places, how do I handle the data, right? right. Right. It's, you know, it, it is, I, I recommend that, that companies don't uh, sort of lurch from one law to the next because it can be very maddening. Obviously, there are differences and there are sort of reporting differences. Like, for example, uh, uh, the U.S., all 50 states have data breach notification laws, but they're different. So the reporting requirements may be different. The time frames may be different. And that part is really maddening. But what I have folk, uh, companies focus on is what I call the fundamentals. So things like, you know, are you transparent with your customer? Yes or no. Uh, are you keeping data longer than you need it? Yes or no. Like, are you, uh, you know, are you behaving as if a customer has a fundamental human right to their own information? Yes or no. So being able to answer these questions more broadly sort of change the culture and perspective of a company, I think it's the thing that gets you, you know, a pretty far distance down the road. So if you're operating your company that way, if you're, you're creating software with those things in mind, you're going to be a way ahead of the curve because all these laws have, you know, basic things in common, which is, you know, are you transparent? Are you safe? Are you uh, thinking about how you're going to respond to the individual whose data that you have. So all, you know, if people are thinking in those ways, they'll, they won't have as big a problem to comply with these laws because they already have things in place that will minimize their risk to begin with. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, another question I had was, you know, there, you mentioned one, another one of your, talks that there's something in the works in the state of New York 
for example, that will help you and me or customers, consumers to put a price tag on, on your data, find out how much companies are making off of you, for example. Right. Can you explain that? So, well, well, the, inter- the, the discussion is very interesting in the state of New York. They've introduced this idea of, like of data fiduciary, meaning uh, that, that consumers' data has value. They want to be able to put a price tag of sorts on people's data, and, and that will help people understand kind of the value of the data and why it's important. So let's mm-hmm. give you an example. Let's say... Uh, so Facebook is free. We're just picking on Facebook because they're just the easiest target right now. But <laughs> Facebook is free, right? Uh, and you do whatever it is on Facebook. You like to use Facebook, and that's great. Would you pay for Facebook if it was $1,500 a year? Probably not. Probably wouldn't. But it's possible that Facebook and these other companies are maybe making that much from you as a, as a free user because in exchange for using their software and their tools for free, they could take your data, package it up, and resell it. So the idea um, behind the data fiduciary um, idea in the state of New York is try to put a price tag of some sort, even if it's not exactly accurate, uh, being able to tell someone, you know, when your name and social security number is sold to someone else is worth X or why uh so i you know in some ways you know people are sort of against that so a lot of people i know from europe they really hate the idea of like putting a price tag on data because it sort of diminishes the fact that that privacy is a a fundamental human right and they feel like it's invaluable you can't really put a price tag on it but in some ways i feel like trying to put some type of monetary value on data will help people connect the concept together so maybe you know it's maybe right now the 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 conversation is too like nebulous uh and you know too too fuzzy for people to really understand but let's say let's say if someone told you you know uh you know companies make i don't know let's say they make 10 or twelve thousand dollars a year on your data you know you may say well wait a minute you know maybe I should, you know, sell my data to them and get, you know, some of this money back or whatever. But Mm -hmm. I think because people understand money uh, better than that, being able to tie it to some type of monetary value may help just uh, further the conversation and help people understand what exactly is happening with their data. Yeah, I I know that there are companies out there um, that are monetizing helping people to monetize their, their data. Like DigiMe, we talked with on this show. Um, it's just one example, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because in a way, like you said, you know, being in, in Europe, putting a price tag on data sort of diminishes that whole fundamental human right of privacy. So uh, it's an interesting conversation and we could probably talk about for the rest of the show. But by the way, we only have a couple minutes. So I want to give you a chance to, um, to talk a little bit about the future. Um, what would you like to see happen or what, what do you think will happen or final thoughts, you know, for our audience? Okay. Well, I'd love to have some consensus on just sort of basic base things just around the world. And I don't, you know, maybe this is too much of a kumbaya moment, you know, Let's say we like all agree that people need to have transparency into their data, and that's like all that we can agree on. I would be happy if there were, you know, we would come together and come to those sort of basic fundamental uh, ideas about data. Um, I also feel like this is a really serious issue, and it impacts us in our day-to-day lives, especially with things like biometrics. You know, people using our face, our fingerprints for different things. It really touches to the core of sort of what we are and how we sort of live our lives. So for me, it's really important that we get the message out there, that we're talking with companies and businesses to help them navigate these things, that we're uh, educating folks about data and data privacy and data privacy rights. And then hopefully, you know, on consumer or businesses, we can come to some consensus about what makes the most sense. Right. So worldwide, do you see something like a worldwide, like a UN for data privacy or anything that crazy? 
<laughs> I don't know if we can, I don't know, I don't think there's enough consensus in the world on anything else that that would actually happen you know again maybe that's my kumbaya moment of it uh, I do think that co- countries will start to do a little bit more like the EU and maybe sort of break out agencies that deal just with data stuff uh, because I feel like com- uh, countries are overwhelmed with uh, you know the laws and the things that are happening in society and I feel like the ex- you know trying to throw this onto existing frameworks is, you know, maybe not sufficient. So I think having other agencies or organizations around the world that are, you know, focused specifically on data and data privacy rights, I think that will come more of the norm because, you know, this is sort of out of hand at this point as far as I, I'm concerned. Uh, but I would love to see, especially in the U.S., if we can get more uh type of legislation that is, uh, you know, federal, on a federal level. So I'm not holding my breath about this. And I know if even we get something, uh, you know, uh, federal, on a federal level, it won't be as robust as maybe we'd like it to be. But I think you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to wrap it up for today. Debbie, it's been a real pleasure to have you, um, an honor to have you with us today. So thank you so much for joining us, coming on the show. Hope you come back because it's a longer conversation. And uh, yeah, just been really nice to have you. So thanks. Um, To those, no, you're welcome. Thank you. To those of you who are listening in, if you like what you've heard today, feel free to share the love with your friends. Any questions or comments for either of us? or for IDCA or for Debbie, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We're on Twitter at IDCAAB, on Instagram and LinkedIn, or you can always find us on IDCA.com where you can sign up for a free trial. It's frictionless connection, collaboration, and co-flow with privacy built in. Uh, you can find Debbie on Twitter at Data Diva Debbie, which is kind of fun, and via her website at DebbieReynoldsConsulting.com. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you on the next Good Tech.